Gentlemen, you are both drunk on cosmic wine. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Mark Sylvester. And I'm Dr. Richard Schulman. This, this is, is All Psych. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, wow. That's quite an intro. Well, I just try to be dramatic whenever I can, you know, it's... Uh, I see it as you're trying to get the first word in on our on our show today. No, actually, I wasn't. It was the first sound. Oh. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a word. Touché. Because, because today, today we're going to be doing nootropics and psychedelics. But since you're Rude, e- man. eager to hack your way into the conversation, why don't you kick us off with our uh, mental wealth tip of the day? The mental, tel- the <laughs> mental wealth tip of our day is state dependent learning the psychophysiological state you're in when you learn something determines how you remember it so if you're studying for a test in school and you drink a lot of coffee make sure you drink coffee before you take the test it'll be easier to remember what you learned and that's your mental wealth tip for the day that's that's terrific and in a wonderful segue into the nootropic discussion because I don't know, I kind of feel like a lot of people have heard the term nootropic. But I think, I, I think that's what happens with ah, nootropic. Yeah, it sounds painful. I mean, of course, yeah. it comes from the Greeks because they did everything far before we did and, yeah. and better. But the, the word, if you break it apart, literally means uh, mind turning. Like the noo has to do with the, with the mind or the psyche. And then the trope, uh, it means a turning, which kind of like I interpret as something that changes the way that you think or feel. But specifically like the uh, stimulant, like the caffeine you were talking about, nootropics have, uh, they're also called smart drugs or cognitive enhancers. So they have a specific effect on cognition and they're supposed to help our brains work better with regards to um, cognition specifically one of the prize tools of sentience and the master evolution uh, of our of our humanoid like brain here it's probably the greatest achievement of the, of the organic component of it um, and one that we still debate whether or not it's you know proof of of a of a of of no of, of a god and, and a soul and something that controls us like a puppet through via the pineal gland, or if it's just an artifact of an extremely complex system, more complex and more neurons than there are stars in the sky. We're not gonna get to that question today, but the nootropic thing is pretty cool because it's something showing that there's a, a large number of people interested in our goal, which is understanding consciousness, um, expanding consciousness, expanding our understanding of, of what the brain is capable of doing um, and, and thinking and learning and memory, but also things that make us more human, like our, our judgments and uh, uh, preconceived notions, a lot of the errors and remnants of, of evolution that our brain is forced to deal with, you know, biologic urges being um suppressed by the frontal lobe for instance so you don't uh you know take a dump on the capital or something like that or blurt out something inappropriate at a board meeting Uh, so it comes in it comes in handy i think i've done that one what take a dump in the capital i wouldn't admit that because it turns out if you video it i'm not in the video Uh, i yell out something inappropriate at a board meeting Oh yeah, I do that all the time. But uh, yeah, I know, me too. You know, what was interesting is we always go back, like, oh, this term goes back to ten thousand years ago. Uh, Nootropic is was only coined in nineteen seventy two by our token dead white guy of the day, Cornelia Gugel. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. If not, even if you didn't, it's very exotic. I like it. Yeah, actually, I can't really see that well with my glasses, but but he was talking about these molecules and their effect on the higher level and in, in you know activity in the brain and cognition like we talked about and the thing that i liked about him one he coined it two he basically gave five criteria for a molecule substance or whatever you want to think about it anything that affects the brain's ability to be classified as a nootropic 
And what he said was one, it should aid with improvement in working memory and learning. Check, like caffeine would fall. If we were looking at that definition, caffeine would definitely fit into meeting that first requirement. The second, it supports the brain's function under hypoxic conditions or after electroconvulsive therapy. What? That was a fun one because it's a suggesting that there's a neuroprotective role of this substance. Are you promoting Jean-Luc Picard? Well, this one, this one had, wasn't clean. Neither so. was this, but man, you got, you got to take one for the team sometimes. Well, I have to bring it back and, and wash it, I guess, because I took one for the team and it made it dirt. All you got was a bunch of dirt in your mouth. So, you know, ECT, why he brought that in there, I don't know. We do know about glutamate excitotoxicity. That can happen after a seizure or a stroke. It has to do with the beginning of a bad cascade of, uh, you know, apoptosis and cell death and um, basically through over excitation of glutamatergic neurons. These are 70% uh, of the neurons in the brain use glutamate as a neurotransmitter. And it turns out it can actually harm itself when the brain's injured in that way. Sometimes ECT, you see excitotoxicity. Um, and then hypoxia, you definitely see because it's a brain injury like a stroke or anything else. So I don't think caffeine fits that model. Um, and I think that's is where some of the confusion comes in because nootropics, most people would say, oh, those are things used for cognitive enhancers that don't fit nicely into any other category. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people like our token dead white guy, Cornelio here would say, well, no, he's looking literally for these, these five requirements. So caffeine fails too. Um, three, again, kind of related protection of the brain from physical or chemical toxicity. So again, there's a, that's the second neuroprotective component. Um, and in my estimations, none of them are clearly neuroprotective. Uh, it's not entirely true, but it's pretty weak on that argument. Four, and now we're getting back into the main definition, natural cognitive functions are enhanced. So it just makes your brain work better, you know, so we can all be like Elon Musk or whatever. The fifth thing is it, it has to be non-toxic to humans, has to not cause depression or stimulation of the brain. Caffeine fails that again, too. So some people consider caffeine to be a nootropic by the guy who coined the term. Uh-uh. So okay. put that in your pipe and smoke it. I think the people who do know about nootropics and have talked about them, one of the first things that they, one of the first substances that comes to mind are what's called the racetams. Have you seen this? Have you heard about this? No. Austin, can you fact check that? <laughs> Austin, where, where, where are you? All right. Apparently she's not in here. Um, Paracetam, there's a lot of them. All of them are, are the chemical structure racetams, um, which do have low toxicity. They have few side effects. They're thought to be cognitive enhancers. Again, there's not the neuroprotective piece to it, um, but the way that they work is definitely interesting and unique and helps organize them into a proper nootropic because Unlike most drugs, chemicals, herbs, it, they don't necessarily stimulate or mimic a neurotransmitter. They don't directly stimulate neurons. Um, what they can do is support and modulate neurotransmitter systems. So that primarily is acetylcholine, which has to do with the memory and learning, but also glutamate, which has, like I said, 70% of our cells are, are using that. So the, the paracetams or the racetams in general have garnished a lot of interest over the years and people have used them quite successfully um, to enhance, you know, activity at the cholinergic and glutamatergic receptors, which translates into better learning, attention, focus, memory, cognition. And uh, the central nervous system overall responds well because cognition is a very, 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 very high level function of the human brain. The human That's brain does a, an awful lot. Does conventional medicine sign on to this stuff? No. Matter of fact, they pretty much warn that 
that it op- that there's a lot of dangers to that. One, these aren't tested in this way enough. But two, you know, we were talking about is caffeine a nootropic? Well, if you look at other stimulants, like is Adderall in a nootropic? They won't argue maybe so much of that, but modafinil for a while, which is, you know, for uh, sleep, wake, shift disorder and, and uh, uh, narcolepsy is big narcolepsy drug. A lot of people considered modafinil a nootropic. So then there's the, you know, the, 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 the establishment, the doctors and the AMA and the government were concerned that, of course, that might promote diversion of prescription drugs for, for their not intended use and stuff like that. But the racetams continue to be very high up on the on the interest list for nootropics, and not to get too biochemical, but for for our for our our geek dorks out there that think the way that I do, specifically they activate um, these receptors through kind of a second message sister system, and also through the AMPA. Um, which is similar to the NMDA receptor, which glutamate handles, but uh, they model lot, they they modify and modulate activity there. So it's not like the normal chemical drug having an effect on brain directly, which we're going to talk about with psychedelics is almost exactly what happens. Um, even to the point where some psychedelic microdosing, some people consider to be nootropic. Which well, again, they, they're using it like in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's yeah, I'm almost like a a thing to stay uh, abreast of, you know, the competition. You microdose psychedelics because it enhances your creativity, supposedly. Uh, and in an attempt to improve mood and, and cognition, specifically the cognition, which is interesting, because mm-hmm. um, most people don't feel like they cognate that well if they're tripping on LSD, but. There are a lot of herbs, and I, 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 you know, could could bore everyone to tears on this, and you could really go down the volume of what potential nootropics are. But I thought the representing the racetams was really kind of key. But speaking of some specific herbs, um, especially ones that people have heard of, ginseng or Panax ginseng or Korean ginseng, and then ginkgo biloba, got a lot of interest as cognitive enhancers, memory enhancers, remember, um, and, and again, Western medicine has looked at this time and time again, and was like, yeah, ginseng's garbage, it doesn't work. Um, I don't know if I, that convinces me, uh, ginseng uh, and, and ginkgo have been used for thousands and thousands of years. So I think that their measuring cognition turns out to be much harder than than it seems uh, on, at face value. There's a, another Ayurvedic traditional medicine um, called Bacopa Monieri, which is really kind of interesting because out of all of them, it's the one that probably is the most believable to Western medicine, not only as an antioxidant and an adaptogen, but specifically cognitive enhancer. Now, if it does that through um, its effect as an antioxidant and helps the brain naturally work better, that makes a whole lot more sense than um, augmenting the brain. Like the, we tend to think of the racetams. Is that really, I mean, does it augment the brain in any kind of measurable way or just people feel like it does? Well, so that last herb actually has some evidence that it it, like similar to caffeine that it, it does augment cognition and memory. Cool. And um, on and on. I mean, it's a lot of these people haven't heard of. I'll, I'll mention Salvia officinalis because it's related somewhat to its close cousin, uh, Salvia divinorum, which is a quarter of the divine sage, a member of the mint family, brought back by Gordon and Wasson in 1957, I think. Um, and it is psychoactive. And I was six weeks from publishing the discovery of the psychoactive compound when I was working with Deborah Mash down at the University of Miami um, before Salvinorin A was discovered as being the psychoactive component of that drug and another research uh, team beat us to it. So mm-hmm. my claim to fame went out the where, w- window there. I thought your claim to fame was the show. It is, that's why. But my first claim to fame. There you go, I see you. I mean, I... I I, I don't want to cut nootropic short, but there is so much fodder on, on the psychedelics. I think it's a good, good transition into psychedelics. 
Well, I'll bring somebody in to help us. Oh, the wizard. A, a wizard showed up. So he usually hides in here. We're letting him out for today. Are you going to do some puppeteering for us? Can he tell us about psychedelics? Buy low, sell high. Oh, I think that's the wrong show. Okay. That's, that's Jim we'll, Cramer. We'll go back. We'll that's go Jim back. Cramer. Well, I mean, you know, in the 60s, uh, we, we all look for purple hats, you know? You're probably all wearing purple hats. What are you talking about? Yeah, actually, that's true. I, I could probably, I could dig up a, a photo if you want to publish it next week. Yes. Okay. But you and I talked before the show that the amount of information that we got in researching this this Ooh. show was was overwhelming. And we kept having to narrow it down, narrow it down, narrow it down. Because if we start at the beginning of, of time, I would argue the moment humans knew that they were sentient and that probably even before that, if they could, you know, eat a berry or or one of their one of their goats or something accidentally chews on coffee beans or plants um they observe an effect and humans constantly are modifying the way that they think and feel especially if it's uncomfortable um they want to change the way that they think or feel and that you know we know at least ten thousand years back that we've been using psychedelics in some medicinal mm -hmm. religious spiritual uh, a lot of different reasons so we can't even touch that with a 10-foot pole we uh, we could talk about the Greeks. We we get thousands of years closer. I'm going to reduce the valve down to like post 1950, and really want to focus on the use of psychedelics in modern medicine. But as it pertains to expanding consciousness, awareness, and all of the goals that we are attempting to achieve as a result of our good hard work here and the um transformative era of of what's happened the last year and how people's mental health has suffered as a consequence so uh, there's a lot of fun stuff here i had a lot of fun researching this um where do you want to dive in i mean i, 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 would, I would dive in with uh i think it was now i'm gonna blow it albert hoffman is that the all right we could we could start there um, Albert, you know, I think it was Alfred, but it's Albert. And you know, he called LSD his problem child. Mm -hmm. And I could see why. You know, well, they, you know, they were using it for psycho, sort of a psychotherapy uh, drug for many years before it got outlawed. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I got a whole, whole little spiel on that. But I, I wanted to uh, kind of touch. Well, I mean, I guess let's define the word because Interestingly, the word psychedelic does come from the Greek, which psyche could be the soul, mind, um, and the delon or the delic part of it is to manifest or reveal. So <laughs> mind revealing, um, some psychedelics are considered entheogenic. Entheos is God revealing. Do you, um, think, do you think that a psychedelic experience Let's see if I can ask this question correctly. Obviously, we're talking about substances, but there's a psychedelic experience that you can access in other ways. We did a whole show on that. We did a whole show on that, right. Um, would you consider those ways psychedelic? Or does it have to be a substance? I would that, consider it a psychedelic experience. Yeah, anything that is mind revealing or entheogenic, God generating, which entheogenic is a little more nasty word. But don't forget, psych before psychedelics, they used to call psychedelics psychotomimetics because mm -hmm. they were looking for a model. Um, to simulate mental illness and they noticed that there were a lot of features that psychedelics produced that may have common um overlap symptoms with with schizophrenia or, or other uh you know mental illnesses at the time 
And luckily that word kind of fell out of favor as they realized, wait, not only it, it, these aren't just for um, uh, mimicking psychotic states, these have therapeutic potential. And like you said, that really starts in the 50s. Uh, and probably the person I credit the most is a name that you hear about the least. Uh, a lot of people have heard of Aldous Huxley. A lot of people have heard of Albert Hoffman. But um, Humphrey Osmond oh. was a really interesting character. Around 1953, um, he, he, he was a psychiatrist that treated Aldous Huxley, essentially, before, right? Before the LSD got... Uh, totally kind of into the hippie counterculture, treated him with um, mescaline. And, you know, Huxley was willing and e uh, eager guinea pig in his words. But what Osmond learned is, holy cow, psychedelics have uh, a modern therapeutic application, which is what you were talking about at the beginning of the show. And, and it took off. It really took off very quickly in terms of the, the the 1950s being the birth of modern application of psychedelics in in healing, really, whether that's bread and butter, depression, it was studied with everything, um, schizophrenia, and uh, uh, even I think even autism in children they gave LSD. Of course, it was later used, which we talked about before, by the military and trying to. Um, disable uh, enemy troops which is very good at doing that as well but they started, they started with ours though yeah and so the goal was to be mind manifesting now we, you know we kind of touched briefly on mescaline and lsd but there's tons of other ones people are familiar with from the mushrooms whether that's the um, psilocybin containing or the much much older and often missed uh, Amanita muscaria, which is the fly agaric mushroom that uh, Alice in Wonderland uh, took her down the rabbit hole, uh, which contains a psychoactive compound called mucimol instead of, as opposed to psilocybin. But any of these, he realized very early, consist of an opportunity in various stages where one of the goals is ego dissolution, which is really quite fascinating. I watched a really great YouTube video and I wish I could comment more on it, but they were um, looking at ayahuasca in this case and they were doing fMRIs both before, during and after an experience. And it was very, very interesting how the regions of our brain that we think are most associated with uh, constructing our ego in the classic sense that you and I understand ego um, shift are turned off and actually kind of reset, reboot after the experience. To me, that was profoundly eye-opening, um, not because it was new information, but because it was a lot more concrete evidential information that I thought was really fascinating because one could argue one of our biggest problems in drifting away from the nature of ourself and our struggles in the last year with power, control, political strife, pandemic fears, attitudes. Um, I'm right, you're wrong. This is my candidate, yours sucks. <laughs> really is an ego problem. It really fundamentally comes down to an overactive ego is the way I think of it or a region of the brain responsible for our ego, just like your amygdala might be overactive and fear-based or anxiety-based disorders. So if you think of that as a target of the psychedelics, neurobiologically, that's super fascinating. But then there's also a, a um, psychological transpersonal, which we've talked about. And this is an age-old argument and one of the um, original uh, things that uh, when I met Dr. Culp, one of, one of our partners here in Gainesville, and we were, we were actually studying ketamine at the time, which is a um, modern, still used anesthetic, uh, very close chemical re relative of PCP, which again, 
that they would say caused psychotomimetic effects. It was also a really great way to study near-death experiences, which we've talked about on the show before too. But he, he was much more interested in the psychological transpersonal effects of, of introducing a psychedelic. Um, and then I was much more interested in the neurobiologic, like, yeah, 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 forget set and setting and who cares what they're thinking or feeling, banging at them just like Prozac. And it turns out, I think we were both wrong and both right at the same time. And we touched on an age old argument, which is why does this work? How does this work? Is it more than the sum of its parts? I was uh, listening to a lecture can't think of the guy's name offhand, but he's a brain researcher and he's talking about the default mode. And uh, I work with a brain trainer named Nickel Bacharach. So I called Nickel up and I said, do you know what the default mode is? And, and he got real quiet. I said, because have you been listening to stuff about psychedelics? Mm. And I said, yeah, have you ever worked with it in your practice? And he said, no. And I said, would you like a guinea pig? because I would like to see if you can access that. It was fascinating. I had a spiritual trip. He had me on the machine for probably around 45 minutes. It felt like about two minutes. And I had all these spirit, this spiritual imagery come up and it was like a shamanic journey going down tunnels. And um, it was really something, no hangover either. No depression, I felt great. It felt great for a couple of days afterwards too. Yeah, and I mean, that's what you were saying before, that this doesn't have to be a drug-altered state. We talked about holotropic breath work. Now, I still <laughs> think there's a chemical um, component to ho in holotropics. Um, you know, what we've mentioned Maduna's mixture, and which um, certainly is not a drug, but it's increasing artificially carbon dioxide, inhaled carbon dioxide, and what the brain does as a response when it's completely well fed for oxygen and, and all of its other needs. So right. it just can change the acid base chemistry in the blood enough to cause profound, if that's even the mechanism of holotropic breath work. Well, I have a feeling it's a lot more than that. I think so too. But you know, it, when you I, going through the, the uh, stuff that I read preparing for this, they did talk about the um, substances enhancing trance states for people, which by the way, <laughs> connecting with our mental wealth tip of the day, trauma is encoded in this kind of a state, which is why this stuff can help post-traumatic stress uh, problems. Absolutely, and the MDMA studies uh, by Michael Midhofer in South Carolina, um, funded by MAPS largely and mm -hmm. uh, have been, I mean, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but have been the most exciting recent uh, advances and in, in, in interest in, in, in reutilizing re this tool. Because what happened is, like you said, a lot in the 50s and really the 60s as well, which is a mm -hmm. pretty good amount of time. Yeah, yeah. Shrinks were using this as, as a therapeutic oh, modality. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know, um, especially uh, uh, substance use disorders. Early on in the 50s, looking at alcoholism, that was one of the things that they noticed was uh, very, very startlingly successful, similar to how ketamine can, in one therapeutic application, totally remove depression and suicidal thinking that was stunning that kind of shook the foundations of everything we know we think we know about depression and the neurobiology of depression similarly there were people that took one dose of lsd alcoholics and stopped just stopped cold turkey mm -hmm. um, and they reproduced these results matter of fact uh we published a paper dr kolp and i with uh, uh dr krabitsky krabitsky in in russia who was one of the groundbreaking uh, psychedelic assisted therapeutic applications of, of um, for alcoholics, really ketamine, uh, talked about LSD, talked about Ibogaine, which is another thing I worked with uh, Deborah Mash about. But the problem kind of 
Well, there was two problems. One, the counterculture, the, the hippie movement, um, it's kind of similar to what we're seeing happen right now where something else gets swept up and, and caught up in, in another, um, the, 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 the zeitgeist, I guess, of, of the era. They, well, I mean, as a person who uh, lived through the 60s, and you know what they say is you, if you remember the 60s, you probably were not there. Um, I found this stuff to be a little on the scary side, actually. Um, I watched people uh, have really bad trips, really bad experiences, and I'm fairly loosely wrapped to begin with. Um, so I didn't think it was going to be the best idea. Well, I mean, the problem was that kind of similar to MDMA and even ketamine to some degree, well, to a large degree when it spilled out onto the rave underground culture really started out in Texas of all places. And in the nineties, it, it really kind of submarined any therapeutic advancements potential um, that, that had been had. And the same thing happened with LSD. A lot of people don't know Bill W, the, uh, the founder of AA uh, was very fond of LSD and its role in alcoholism right. and AA wasn't really totally sure what to do with that because he's like the godfather but Bill Wilson basically I've always admired his writings I think he had a connection or a depth to the human condition or, or the soul or insight into why we are the way that we are and, and could uh, articulate that in a way that I, I just don't see done very well, very often. But, you know, in his words, he felt it helped him eliminate many barriers erected by the self or ego that stand in the way of one's direct experience of the cosmos or, or of God. And what he knew is for the, the treatment of alcoholism to work at the brainstem level the same part of our brain that tells us when to get hungry or, or horny or, or thirsty. You know, these are impulses, biologic drives. We cannot repress. We can suppress them. Mm -hmm. I say that backwards, but <clears throat> he knew that there, there had to be some sort of a spiritual type of transpersonal experience. And that may involve ego disillusion. Now, could it be done with a chemical? Sure. Could it be done with holotropic breath, breath work or, or yoga? Sure. Could it be done with complete and utter demoralization? Yeah, because that can be very ego fracturing. But what he, one of the things he was famous, infamous I, to some degree, uh, quoted as saying, it, it is generally acknowledged fact that um, spiritual development, you know, in spiritual development, ego reduction makes the possibility for influx of what he called God's grace, um, which I would call like some sort of divine intervention or a download from your higher self or mm -hmm. something that actually breaks the cycle of, of, of addiction. I've seen um, that with the uh, patients going through the Kundalini stuff that we talked about in the past. And what occurs to me as we talk about this uh, the psychedelics and the role in medicine is as you start to di dive into the literature and as a, once again, as a person who did a lot of the Groff work, the things that they encourage you to do are very sort of positive, could also be looked at as psychotherapy things, except, you know, they say, you know, don't go to a rave dance, I guess, you know, because it, you, you could freak out a little bit. But I think that what um, what we've missed in our culture, because you know the, there's three letter agencies we're using this testing them on unsuspecting uh, army personnel. That was a movie called The Men Who Stare at Goats, which had a lot of truth to it. By the way, I mean it was a funny movie. It was fun, but it was very serious because I had a friend who who participated in those kinds of experiments, and he said they were serious. So it got out in the public. The problem was a matter of dosage. The psychotherapy dose versus the let's have fun with it dose or let's see how much we can take. 
you know, because it, it, like two drinks are good, you know, 25 are definitely right. low, you know. So people were taking mega doses of this stuff and they weren't ready. And I remember a kid that I treated and he had a lot of really weird uh, anxiety symptoms. And I, and I, whenever I deal with kids, especially, I always ask them, you know, what's your drug of choice? So he, he said, uh, LSD, and I said, okay, well, how many trips have you taken? He said, I don't know, like 500 to 1,000. <laughs> What? It seemed like a lot to me, and I said, "Well, well, no wonder you're you're fried." <laughs> I, I'm not. I said, you, "No wonder you're fried. You're taking a very powerful spiritual drug. You're not treating it with any respect." See, I think that's uh, that's a clarification point. I don't think the drug is spiritual. Well, it opens I, the gate. I think the drug allows the artificial creation or disassembly of the psychological constructs the prisons of the mind that set up our walls and boundaries within us you know like like he talks about houston smith i think cleansing the doors of perception or the concept that you know we have this reducing valve that lsd and psychedelics then open up and they allow um part of the ego dissolution for you to see things in a, in a unique and different way, which in and of itself can allow a spiritual experience. Yeah, and, and I wonder, uh, if, I wonder if the her. definition of spiritual experience really implies that you can take it with you. Um, what I noticed with a lot of the kids that I work with, <coughs> excuse me, that um, whatever lesson they got, they didn't really take it with them. Mm -hmm. And I remember one guy saying to me, uh, how am I going to get there without this? You know, I said, well, you know, people have been, you know, dancing, doing yoga, praying, you know, for millennia. You know, they didn't always have LSD. They might have had peyote. <laughs> but um, one of the most ingenious things I've heard you say was God doesn't need a starship. Was that me? That was you. And it was, it's to, to your point that you're making right now that in order to have a spiritual experience of that nature, it does not require a vehicle, a drug um, yeah, to create I, I, that spiritual experience. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of belaboring the point, but it's a really important point because so many of the problems that come out of the use of these substances is the belief that like Xanax causes tranquilizing that psychedelics cause spiritual experiences. And that's definitely not the case. They can cause well, hellish experience. They can cause no experiences. They can cause synesthesia, all kinds of crap. That's not a spiritual experience. I think there's enough uh, anecdotal evidence, if not real research, to show that people have what they believe to be spiritual experiences, uh, a oneness with everything, you know. Um, a distortion of our, our consensual reality, you know, which allows us to perceive the world differently. Now, to me, it was though, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sort of emotional street fighter. Um, and to me, I wanted to know from a practical point of view, were people taking this experience with them? Now, apparently in the 50s and probably early 60s, when they were using these, like you said, on, on alcoholics, um, it seemed to me that the research that they did, and of course they shut it down, go figure, um, was that people were able to maintain the gains that they got when treating a specific symptom. Well, and, and we we're going to come to that at the end of the show, kind of the, the work that you did on uh, how do you, so then how do you target this therapeutically? So that's it's pretty, that's it's, coming. That's the best part, it's I think. Pretty interesting stuff, actually. But going back to Bill Wilson, that you know, that's what he said. You know, uh, if under LSD we can have a temporary reduction, kind of all of all of that noise, we can better see what we are, who we are, where we're going. And he, you know, felt regular use of LSD in a carefully controlled, structured setting, which we're going to come to would be beneficial for, for alcoholics. He did add a caveat. And again, he's must be quoting a lot 
from the psychiatrist he was working with that it should only be attempted by individuals with well-developed super egos. Mm, okay, how do we how do we sift them out? How do we yeah, quantify well, that's that? A, that's a good question. I'm reminded, and I, I wish I could remember who who said this. You have to be somebody before you can be nobody. And because I, I like and that. I think that what people report under these conditions is a dropping of ego, kind of an, an ego death kind of situation. And, and uh, I was speaking with someone who, who uh, works with ayahuasca down in uh, Costa Rica. She works with uh, addicts. And uh, I was trying to send a patient to her. He said, well, the patient has to be clean for a month before we can work with him, or he literally could die from the stuff. And I said, well, he, <laughs> that ain't happening. Yeah. Um, then she said, well, why don't you come? I said, uh, no, I wouldn't, I'm not going to do that. And she said, well, why not? You would send your patient. And before I could answer what she said was really interesting. She said, oh, your unconscious is always open. Hmm. So the idea that it would, that reducing valve made sense to a person who probably never read Hulk Huxley, who, you know, who was doing this in the, in the trenches with shamans, you know, and, yep. and I, I found that absolutely fascinating. And the, the stuff that I've read, I mean, a lot of the stuff, it sounds like Buddhism. Well, you know, remember what? when we talked about Richard Alpert, or Richard Alpert Ram Das yes. giving his guru in India LSD, right. waiting to see what this, uh, you know, spiritual giant, like, how, because he was thinking about LSD being a drug given by the gods. I don't know what, it's synthetic. It was Albert Hoffman's problem child but if you're taking someone super spiritually evolved present aware whatever and then you're giving them this drug that's supposed to give people spiritual experiences right, whoa right. what's gonna happen and paradoxically nothing happened because that mm -hmm. drug doesn't provide that it, it well he was he get was ourselves higher, out of the way he was higher than the what the drug was uh he was yeah he was like yeah yeah. yeah, I meditate. It's better than that. Yeah, you know, it's 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 kind of uh, synchronicity that I came up with that mental wealth tip because we're looking at psychophysiological states that open people to certain experiences. And I think if we if we define it as that, it becomes pretty interesting. Uh, what because there's a potential for people to learn. I go back to that kid that took, I don't know, he said 500 to a thousand trips. I don't know how much he got after the first one or two trips. It was more like a, a trip to Disneyland, I guess. And he was using it for recreation rather than some kind of deep spiritual learning or, or emotional symptom relief. Well, and of, I've like, used the analogy with you before and this, uh, um, we, we had Miguel Rivera on the mm -hmm. show. And it was actually Dr. Rivera who said that, you know, people attempting to peek behind the, the robe of God and take a drug to see God, meet God, know God, the entheogenic attitude approach, um, it will be more elusive for them than all. It's, it's sort of like the bouncing on the trampoline and seeing over the wall, a high wall to see the city below. And you can take a psychedelic and it can bounce you mm -hmm. um, up and down 500, 1,000 times, but you're, you, you can't take the next step. It took you to that point where you got to peek over, but to actually live like, like Ram Dass's guru, to live in that state, to be much more connected is really about learning how to build a ladder to traverse the wall and actually be able to enter the city, which... Uh, was another thing that really transformed my life and and belief and understanding on the pitfalls of the therapeutic applications of psychedelics. And so it's, it's a really important point you make. I saw a, a psychologist when I was in California who told me I was an altered states junkie. I mean, I, I don't like drugs and I don't use them. I don't judge anybody who does, but it, they don't work for me. But I was doing the holotropic breath work regularly. And he said, you know, next time you do a breath work, you think about it for six months before you do another one. Mm. And I think that the idea, so I've seen people who had profound experiences 
on psychedelics. And when they processed them, the experience became more meaningful. Uh, yeah, 100%. And that's kind of wh where Dr. Culp and I evolved over the years. Um, because two, really in the 50s and 60s, two types of psychotherapy, LSD-assisted psychotherapy, uh, became popular. Psychedelic psychotherapy, psychedelic therapy, psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, which was based on Osmond and Hoffer's work, um, where you know you take LSD concurrent with psychotherapy, and that the hallucinogens are beneficial therapeutically because the ability to reshift people's perspective and see things from a from a fresh perspective versus the psycholytic therapy, which is um, several smaller doses increasing in size as an adjunct to psychoanalysis. And then you do a lot more dreamlike interpretation of the unconscious mind. Sometimes they can access old older memories. So it kind of goes back to the whole neurobiologic versus psychological effect of what these things are doing. And, and over the years, what I've learned is the answer is both. You have to consider them both, uh, the potential strengths and weaknesses of both. You know, 40,000 patients had been prescribed LSD um, in the 50s and by 1965. But like we said, it came to an abrupt halt because uh, Congress had some new concerns about this drug safety regulations, the FDA labeled it experimental. And then what did that do? It kind of drove it underground. And then the hippie movement and the, and the acid blotters and the sugar cubes all uh, grew in popularity. And man, 1967 and the summer of love and you got, uh, you know, hate Ashbury and all this crazy, all the damn hippies everywhere. We got to do something about <laughs> and uh, they made it illegal very, very quickly in 1968. Well, I, you know, not to put my tinfoil hat on, which, you know, I wear now and then. I don't know where it is today. I have my black hat, but not the tinfoil hat. Uh, I think that's the one. Okay. Um, I can put that on. Um, no, that's not tinfoil. The, uh, the army, the experiments that the, that the CIA was doing were mega doses. For remote and, viewing and no, they were using it for mind control uh, experiments. Uh, how are they going to get a better soldier, or what would happen if they put it in the water supply of a right? You know, and the British a, soldiers that totally were decimated by the high. Oh yeah, absolutely. But I think that, and I don't know if it's just the natural progression of things. Of what happens, you know, if two if two aspirin is good, then two hundred must be better in, in our culture anyway. And people were having really bad experiences that caught the news media. And, and you know, they like to run with stuff if it bleeds. Oh, yeah. it bleeds. So it became sort of a cause celeb. It wasn't being used appropriately. You know, um, literally, if you were supposed to use two aspirin, they were using the equivalent of 200 or 2000. And this is very strong stuff. And that, you know, um, maybe if we can extend the analogy of the trampoline, maybe that's like, instead of you bouncing on the trampoline, that's like being shot out of a cannon. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you might get higher up, but you're going to be a little flailing, disoriented, seeing other things that you're not looking for, like the clouds or your, maybe your ass flipping over your elbows or <laughs> um, that, that you're right, you there's... There's two possibilities, at least. There's probably more, but the two main ones is number one, we go back to state dependent learning and the trauma may be encoded in the kind of state that you reach with the psychedelics. But the other one is, you know, people who grow up in places like India, they might prepare for something like this for 25 years. Mm -hmm. You know, yoga, meditation, prayer, you know, because it's part of the culture or Native Americans who will take peyote. They will have a spiritual goal. They've been intent. Sure. They've, they've been they've been studying this since they were kids about how to do this. So now we got some kid at a party, you know, who's had a, you know, he's had a, one too many beers, and somebody says, "Hey, why don't you try this?" Right, and has well, never he, experienced that, anything. He's not ready. It. He's not sure. ready. There's no map, and the that's thing why. Love, well, that's why it should be assisted. You know, obviously in a therapeutic. That's why I like the Groff approach. And Groff studied LSD before he 
Oh yeah. Went to the holotropic breathwork. The idea that that um, there's a uh, a map, a cosmic map of things that you could encounter, and then sort of a uh, a way of doing it. You know, where where um, for example, it, it was like you 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 need to have set and setting. You sure. Know? You have to, uh, and... you know, the, the, you know, you don't uh, talk down to people. You talk through them, or you, uh, you know, you uh, you just provide them with what they need to process. And uh, how about this? An uncanny experience, you know, one that you're not ready for, you're not prepared for. You know, it's in other words, you sit with the person. You don't try to guide them. You let that experience uh, unfold. Um, and when people hit like difficult things, you, you don't make it into bad, you make it something that they're learning from. That idea to me makes a lot of sense that you could open things up, process them therapeutically, and then move forward in a accelerated way. You yes. Move, you know, and I think that, that doing it mindfully rather than just saying, well, here, take this and see what happens. Well, and keep in mind that was the original intent. People have uh, younger people, especially, think well, LSD is a is a party drug or it's, oh, it's yeah. a legal drug. But it was a medication. Matter of fact, you know, Sandoz Lab was who was producing this, and um, of course, um, you know, it being the the problem child uh, of Hoffman um, it, it is interesting. But fun fact: Do you remember the brand name of the drug? Lysergic acid diethylamide oh, number twenty-five. Yeah, I, it was it was close. I don't know. I don't. It was. I'll give you a hint. It kinda, acid or something like that. Something. Yeah, like, it kind of. Like, something like that. Yeah. Delicid. Delicid. And so okay. it's kind of where some people think the term acid uh, came from was that was a play on the brand name, just like we do in you know Mickey's or I mean all of the the or Zanny bars or or Roxy's. You know, <laughs> we make these cute little names. And um, yeah, Delicid was LSD's drug uh, brand drug name. And uh, it, it was used therapeutically for that. And I just found it really fascinating in addition to depression and, and dissociative disorders and all kinds of applications, the substance use disorders, it seems to have the greatest potential and I was the most interested in. And then when people find out Bill, Bill Wilson himself was advocating this, as a matter of fact, his second most famous book after the big book of AA itself was called 12 Steps and 12 Traditions. And he specifically credits LSD, kind of like Be Here Now, <laughs> you know, the Ram Das book, as a lot of the uh, content that was generated um, because he was in a very ego dissolved, um, spiritually flowing um, <laughs> to the point he actually thought that this, and, and you know, you could argue, well, okay, he was taking acid, he, he was tripping out and freaking out, but he really believed a lot of his insights and content for 12 Steps and 12 Traditions came from um, a 15th century monk uh, named Boniface that he was basically in some spiritual communion with because as we go deeper, and we've talked about this in other shows, and you were talking about the roadmap right now, if you're talking DMT, an endogenously occurring um, psychedelic that's in our bloodstream right now, but is released very heavily around the time of death and thought to be associated with a lot of religious transpersonal near death and the like experiences, it, it brings forth um, that accessibility. And the further you go down, yeah, it could be the Tibetan Book of the Dead and a map of the Bardo plane. It could be, you know, re religious archetypes and golden beans that we meet during near death experience or people who take, you know, exogenous DMT um, talk about encountering other beings. A lot of them will describe the beings, describe the, the communication and the intention. John Lilly talked about this and, and aliens and, and Pleiadines and the Earth Coincidence Control Office. It goes layer upon layer and layer deeper. And so the belief just, that he was gaining- remember, remember that when somebody, let's say from the mountains of Mexico takes this and he meets that being, he knows that being is Mescalito. 
and that being is there to have a certain right a certain function so he's not he's not going to be nearly as likely to flip out than if he thinks it's beldar from remulac right you, you know it's um, a spirit quest it's um and they and they're taking it for that right you when you when you want to meet this being and you take this preparation substance to do so it, it won't be nearly i mean it, there may be fear connected with it but not like when you just kind of okay well i'm just going to do this we're at a party we're going to have some fun let's try this and then the right. being shows up and maybe it's not as much uh not as spiritual as you know well and i think you're less likely to have that type of spiritual transpersonal experience because it requires ego dissolution to be able to well, step through what that I'm door is not is that they'll have some kind of experience sure and the label they're going to put on it is very different which will because, generate the anxiety because that don't. kid you said was drinking alcohol alcohol obviously would be a significant confounder in the experience you would be stimulated by the environment which would lock you into your ego like oh i'm a kid at a party on this date worried about parents finding out that i mean there's too much swirling around whereas if you have an intention um you've 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 detoxed dr Culp required that for a lot of his psychedelic assisted ketamine psychotherapy treatments is it would take weeks weeks of preparation not only physiologically but also in session psychologically and then like you said you're very careful during the experience itself but the really healing in addition to the experience itself is the post psychotherapeutic processing and interpretation and, right. and reintegration that's when you actually learn how to build a ladder mm -hmm. cool and and then ideally use holotropic breathwork, yoga, other means that are much more controllable, sustainable, um, and, and effective. Well, you know, when we talk about uh, psychedelics, I mean, the term mind expansion came to be related to psychedelics. But I mean, you know, mind expansion could come from a lot of things, mm. you know, and, and, I, and as with most things in my world, I'm trying to, to do the integration piece. And I, and I think there's great value in psychedelics. And in fact, one of the things that as, as sort of this old hippie type that I, I found really fantastic is the government is now starting to acknowledge that there's health, you know, health and mental health benefits and is opening the door. There are, there are cities, I think it's uh, Oakland and Portland have decriminalized psilocybin. Mm -hmm. um, why it should ever be criminal is beyond me, but um, the, and that Johns Hopkins was studying this, uh, studying psilocybin for its, its health effects. So uh, this, you know, everything is changing and a few things are changing for the good. So I'm very uh, hopeful that it, that these kind of substances can mindfully be brought into the healing arts. Well, uh, and the 1990s, the decade of the brain is really when this started back up. Um, that's when, you know, Rick Doblin's work really took kind of started gaining traction. We know a lot more about the neurobiologic effects and the therapeutic potential based on that um, from, from the Western approach, but that's where we got to start uh, to keep it safe and, and uh, just discover more about the brain and, and the therapeutic application of these states. But, you know, we've got brain scanning experiments to learn. We've got uh, molecular level, level binding studies. We've got um, clinical studies, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, psychedelics. Some are more arguably risky, um, like uh, ecstasy, let's just say. Um, whereas LSD, mescaline, and peyote, um, magic mushrooms, or the fly agarics, they, to me, are kind of in the, the bread and butter LSD. But then we have some extremely safe ones going back to not only ketamine, but dimethyltryptamine itself is something we produce that's as, that's as entheogenic and psychedelic as, as even the most Franken molecule. Ketamine, synthetic. LSD, synthetic. Now there are lysergic acid amides in morning glory seeds that create similar like hallucinogenic effects, 
they tend not to be quite as psychedelic or entheogenic. Um, okay. Ibogaine, we briefly There's mentioned. There's always going to be uh, the issues of timing and dosage when you take anything. You can eat enough salt that it will kill you. Okay. So we tend to, to we've tended to, you know, Hoffman called a problem child. We've tended to make the psychedelics like the bad boys. Okay. They're going to hurt you if you don't do the right dosage. Well, I don't know how to break this to you guys, but anything can hurt you if you, if you do the wrong dosage of it. And, and when we look at addiction, addicts are famous for wanting to do more and more and more and more and more. Yeah, their drug of choice is more. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I want to get these, these guys out of the bad boy. They're really valuable. But like anything else, like, don't be an idiot when you use it. So tell us, this is what all the viewers are wanting to get out of the show today. Tell us the five key lessons in approaching psychedelics to be a useful therapeutic. Okay. Because that, that ties the whole show up together. And it's what we promised to wrap up with. It wasn't buy low, sell high, right? No, that's what we opened with, I think. All right. So, when I, well, the first thing is, let's check with Austin. The, I think the, the main lesson is that it, it redefines our perception of, of illness and of, of um, treatment. You know, you and I both do mind body medicine. You know, we have our own ways of doing it, but we both do it and we both believe in it. Well, imagine what might happen if we open the mind in this profound way while we're doing something else that heals the body or while we're trying to reprogram people's attitudes towards illness, towards, even towards death. Uh, so that's the first one is that we're gonna, it will redefine how we perceive and how we do treatment of, of all kinds of illnesses, not just mental health or addiction. This could be physical illness as well. The second is the idea that there's a, you have to have a set and a setting, okay? You're not supposed to take a psychedelic and go on the subway, for example. Yeah, I mean, that's the kid at the party. Yeah, exactly. That that you create a, um, and, and it goes into the, the third, uh, the third lesson, which is harm reduction. Mm -hmm. You have um, a, a yeah. safe space. You're you the person. I don't know what to call them, the experiencer or the the uh, traveler, tripper. the tripper. <laughs> uh oh that's something else um you want to sit with them you don't guide them you let the experience unfold you talk through things you don't talk down to them no you shouldn't be doing that um uh people may encounter uh negative emotions we have to frame it as difficult rather than bad we're moving through something and, you know, and it's not really the same as a dance party. That, that's sort of the, the fourth thing. And the fifth thing is, you know, as we talked about with holotropic breath work, you can access the state in other ways. You can access it by breathing a certain way. Which is another way to put the nail on the coffin in that the drug is not causing the experience. You know, it's creating, uh, it's modifying the brain to allow uh, the, the creation of, what's beneath to come through to come out it could be just jumbling it up and allow it to look at itself in a different way but people what I would, experience what I would, where i would go with this is that those experiences as non-ordinary as the average person would call them are very human experiences that you know that people have been recording for millennia since there have been human beings and have had spiritual effects but also emotional and, and physical healing kinds of effects so yeah it's fascinating i can't wait to see what's going to happen even in the near future with this stuff i think the this as, as a healing tool i'm just hoping that people keep their minds open to this potential yeah and we're going to keep plugging away until they do um like for example next week i'm thinking mentalism and mysticism Ah, yes, Captain. And until next week. Oh, yeah. We would say one, two, three, 
be well. Four. You just you cheated. Five. You four again. No. One, two, three. Be well. I'm just gonna get, get a get mug. Right with, time? I'm gonna get a mug with "Be Well" on it, and we can just hold that up. It says "Old Psych Show." Yeah, we need one that says "Be Well" too. Okay, there's an E, but there's no B or a W. Oh, there's a W. We could use that. I'll see you next week. Be there or be. Make it so. Make it so, number one. <laughs>